All right. So I think we're going to kick off. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Ezell. I'm the head of community at Maple. We host these lovely panel discussions every month. I am so excited for our panelists that are joining today. We're talking about green parenting and raising eco-conscious kids. It's the perfect panel for the perfect day because it's Earth Day. Um, as you all know, Maple is household organization. We're an application, both web-based and mobile, and we're all about helping families. So we're going to jump off and go around the room. Jessica, do you want to start at Green America? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, this, is, this is just a really exciting panel to be on. Um, my name is Jessica Hulk Dillon. I am with Green America. Some of you may know us from our consumer engagement and consumer advocacy work. We also have a, uh, the Green Business Network, which fosters small green businesses and really helps them succeed. Um, I work in sort of the third bucket of our work, which is called the Center for Sustainability Solutions, where we tackle really big issues that no one group organization can solve. So I am the director of our Soil and Climate Alliance, which is a food and ag supply chain based ne network fo that focused on moving 90% of the 980 million food and ag acres in North America onto the regenerative pathway by the end of 2030. It doesn't mean they're gonna be fully regenerative because fully regenerative is not a thing. It's always a pathway, it's always a process, but really working with um, farmers, companies, consumers, policymakers, researchers, just the whole gamut to, to make that happen. Um, I am joining you guys all from, I'm uh, just outside of DC. The Capitol building is like a mile that way. Um, and apologies if you can hear any of my children banging on the door behind me. My house is very loud. Uh, I have a there we go, a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old who is conveniently sleeping, so. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Uh, Kristen, do you wanna go next at Goodbye Gear? Sure, I wore my shirt so you know who I am, but um, Kristen Langfeld, CEO and co-founder of Goodbye Gear. Uh, and Goodbye Gear is a full-service marketplace. We make it very easy for families to participate in the circular economy. Um, you can shop our massive selection of secondhand and open box goods from anywhere in the U.S. and we deliver it to your doorstep. Um, and then we have a really amazing service where we come to your, your house and we pick up all the items that your kids have uh, outgrown and we bring them to one of our facilities where we quality check them, we price them, we post them up on our website and you can sit back and get paid. So um, we are based in, our headquarters are in Denver, Colorado. That's where I'm calling in from. And um, I have a four and a six-year-old. I'm really excited about this panel and to learn more from the other panelists. Amazing. And Salwood at Cubby Kit, do you want to go next? Yeah, definitely. And it's perfect timing because now my son is about to come and interrupt me um, when he was sitting over there watching Bluey this entire time. But hi, my name is Salwa. Um, I'm the founder of Cubby Kit. It's the easiest and most sustainable way to shop for your baby clothing essentials. We deliver a personalized assortment of baby clothing as your baby grows. And we also have a recycling program to take back your outgrown clothes and recirculate it responsibly. I am a mother of two, a two-year-old behind me and who's supposed to be sick. So I had to grab him <laughs> from daycare early. And then I also have a six-year-old who's at school, thankfully. <laughs> Well, no worries at all. We have all been there before. Um, and, you know, Maple's all about real life parenting and what that's like. So please don't worry at all. If at any time kids run into the room, hi, Bob, it's totally okay. Um, we actually love that. Uh, okay, so we're going to start. Thank you, everyone, for introducing yourself. According to a recent study, 76% of American homes say that their kids are the reason that they are striving to be eco-friendly. And that's really understandable, especially with global warming, population numbers that are reaching into the billions. We have fossil fuels burning at alarming rates. It's important that we learn and we adapt our habits to protect the environment. And it's equally as important to pass these concerns and habits on to our children. I'm very excited today to talk to the panelists in this room. They are responsible for uh, changing product, policy, 
behavior industry. It's very, um, we're very grateful and lucky to have them to share their insights and tips. So we're going to go with the first question. I don't want to focus too much of this conversation on like the doom and gloom of climate change, because I'm sure that we can go down a very dark path. Um, but I do think we need to touch on why every single person should be thinking about and putting effort into changing their habits to better protect the environment. So let's talk about the current state of things. Jessica at Green America, can you just kick us off and give us a brief overview on what climate scientists are saying about climate change and how our behavior is affecting the planet? So the short answer is the climate scientists are saying nothing good right now. Um, you know, I think it's it's so interesting. You know, we we saw so many stories at the beginning, you know, spring and summer of 2020. The air is clear, the rivers are clear, you can see fish in the Hudson. You know, you know, I live in DC, the Potomac was cleaner than it's ever been, um, which really showed the daily, you know, the impact of what our daily life was doing, our daily commuting, our daily traveling, all of these different pieces. And so I think there's two pieces to look at when you talk about behavior. And one is our day-to-day -day behavior, um, you know, recycling. If you live in a place where you can recycle, a lot of places you can't recycle. I was actually just listening to a podcast driving in my car um, about how we can on only about 9% of the plastic that is single-use plastic is recyclable because either the type of plastic or the, the facilities aren't there to properly recycle it. So, you know, it's great to chew, recycle when you can, use less. I mean, I love, um, I love what Kristen was saying, like the amount of stuff you go through with babies and being able to upcycle that and, you know, give it to someone, sell it to someone, things like that are great. Like let's, we absolutely have to reduce that, you know, what, what we're consuming, what we're using, what we're buying and tossing, um, which again is so hard. If you have a kid who you've got to figure out what kind of sippy cup they'll take and you've got to buy 14 of them. Um, yeah, every, everyone's nodding. We all feel that. But then the other piece of behavior and I come out of a policy and out of an activism background is, we also have to be questioning the system that has gotten us to where we are. And that means, you know, calling Congress, that's fun. That's like a hobby of mine. Um, you know, call your members, call other members, um, you know, really making your voice heard, but calling the companies that are contributing to this, calling, you know, the companies, you open something, you're like, why is there so much packaging? Call them. Okay, I take that back. We're millennials at this point. Text them, tweet them like draw attention to these issues because that's where we see change is when we start demanding it from, from the people who are putting these products on the shelves. And, you know, yes, we don't want our kids to be like, mommy, why is this? And why is this? Because your head's going to explode by noon. But if you do things like that, be like, yeah, sweetie, I'm reaching out to whoever made, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, whoever made this cereal bar, because we don't need a wrapper inside of a bag inside of a box unless your kids are like mine and everything gets turned into art. Uh, that is a form of recycling. I encourage that as well. So yeah, just really think about your day-to-day -day life and in the bigger picture, who can you, who can you, you know, tweet at while you're sitting and trying to figure out what's going on or waiting outside of ballet class, you know, use, use your activism where it's accessible and makes an impact for you. I like that. Um, that one piece that you had touched on where if you are seeing as a parent that there's too much packaging or too much waste in a product, being vocal with your kids and saying, oh, look, this bar has three different wrappers. We're probably not going to buy this bar again because I don't like how much trash this is creating. And just starting that sort of feedback loop early. Um, and also your point about tweeting them was hilarious because I, <laughs> our team members just talked today about how we feel like on Twitter, there is that closed feedback loop where you're talking to brands, right at brands all the time. And that's where we get a ton of feedback too, as a company. Well, and really quickly, especially and moms, including dads who do the grocery shopping, how many times, you know, you follow the brands you shop from a lot. And if I were to see like a mom complaining about there's too much packaging or why did you triple the sugar in yogurt? I've seen this one. It makes me in a rage. 45 other parents are like, oh my goodness. 
and then it pops up in their feeds. And it's, I mean, if nothing, we've proven that various forms of social media is a really fast way to get a lot of people being like, what the heck? Yeah. And really paying attention. So. Yeah. So true. Um, Kristen, can you touch briefly talking about product? Uh, can you touch briefly on the impact of home goods and the manufacturing industry and how do the items that we purchase in our lives really affect the environment? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think we, we were talking about food and I love what the example you have, Jessica, about the packaging and, and you know, food is such a big part of our waste. And, um, you know, when you, you look at climate change, there's a study that talks about how 55% of the problem can be solved with renewable energy and the remaining um, has to be solved with circular, with food and with materials. And so food is a big part of it, but materials that we use to manufacture goods, like any hard goods, um, it's something like 45% of our global, and I can send this out in this, our global greenhouse um, gases come from producing things. And so there's a huge responsibility for us to, to change how we consume, you know, like, do you really need that brand new item? Like um, figuring out how to make smarter choices about the items that, that we purchase and ultimately having great stuff, but not too much stuff. And that's really like personally how we try to live. I mean, we're, we're trying to only buy used for our second year in, in a row of hard goods. Um, there's some things that are really hard. And I think that uh, more startups and companies can start doing them. We need a new plates because we only had two plates, but trying to find used plates that match. <laughs> there's not like a, a place you could do that yet, but you know, for clothes and other things, which I know that we'll talk about with, um, with, with you. And so I think that it's really important that we make better choices as consumers for um, buying high quality items that we take care of and that we can put back into circulation when we're done with it and not just be like, I need that new, I need that delivered to me from Amazon yesterday. You know, like, do you really need it? I love that. And something that you said kind of popped into my head and I went, oh, you know, this is interesting. Um, and not to give a shout out to my, my dad as a potter. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there are really, if you think outside the box, there are different ways to buy things, right? So he makes plates in a sustainable way out of clay. He has, yeah, exactly. So he has... Um, 0% waste. He uses everything and he uses non-toxic glazes. He makes them in his shop. So it might be interesting if you're looking to buy new plates, talking to artists in your community that are potters that maybe could make your plates for you. And a lot of the times what happened is he'll have excess and he'll sell them for like 75% off. So you can just ask them, well, when are you having sales? And if you have excess, is there a way for me to buy those products? So you know, creative ways to also buy items for your home that are more sustainable. Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, Salwa, can you talk a little bit about the fashion industry and why it matters what clothes we buy and from whom? Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> it's a really big problem. Can't wear. I'm just like a <laughs> Um, but I mean, like it's, it's no secret, like fashion industry is like one of the biggest polluters on the planet in the U S alone. We generate something like 17 million tons of clothing annually and only 11 million, well, actually all 11 million are landfilled. Only 2 million are recycled or reused. And this is largely driven by the fast fashion consumption model. And that's only like one facet of like the greater ecosystem in the fashion industry, right? Like, so first we're trained to believe that certain garments are a lot less than they actually are. And this is driven from like exploitive labor practices, harmful production of fabric and materials, and, you know, ranging from like underpaid garment workers and using fossil, ba fossil fuel based fabrics and blends that, that are harmful to the environment and when we produce them. Um, second, our manufacturing and production process um, is in general hazardous, right? Like it pollutes ecosystems and the air that, the quality of air in the areas that they're being manufactured. You just cried. <laughs> um, and then, you know, lastly, we're not using materials that are regenerative and, you know, like they, we don't actually have the infrastructure to deal with them in the after, after they're done, right? So, you know, like using cotton is, like the farming practices can be regenerative, they could be good for the soil. But then afterwards, if you start blending them with like polyester or like spandex and things like that, 
we don't actually have the infrastructure to recycle them after. So we don't have anything to do with the waste that we're creating. And then it just ends up in landfills. Or we think that because of this black curtain of greenwashing, we think that when we donate them, we're actually donating them. But the truth is, not all of the donations when you drop it off to the American Cross or the Salvation Army, good, they're not actually donated. They can only have so much and they're a business too. And they, they have to go through some sell through. They have capacity issues. They have waste issues. So then they end up sending it to other developing nations where we think that we're doing some good deed by exporting it to them. And we're giving them life with our second and hand clothes and stuff like that. But really it becomes this whole form of exploitive colonialism where they're kind of forced to take our secondhand clothes and we're undercutting prices of local vendors and local artisans who are producing clothes there. So it just becomes this crazy system and fashion is at the root of it and our consumption is at the root of it because we're made to believe that we need something every two weeks, we need something every four weeks instead of thinking about clothing as a utility. And that's kind of the thing with Cubby with like baby clothing is like baby clothing is a utility. You do get stuff from friends and family members. You do get gifts, um, but you kind of need to piece together what works with your family. So we try to encourage parents to only get what they need. So we deliver like an essential collection. And I think that in itself is just like an empowering message to like at least our consumer base is like, they just appreciate that we're able to fill in the slots of what they're already receiving from friends and family members when they're getting secondhand. And the truth is like with baby clothing, there's bio stains, right? Like <laughs> you can't actually use it. So, you know, to what um, Jessica was saying before about like demanding things from, you know, your the companies that you're shopping at, the most powerful thing that you have is your dollar. And so when you buy something, you're actually voting with your dollar. And so expecting the companies that you're purchasing from and supporting them to kind of like take ownership of the waste that they're creating is like something very important. And I think that there's not enough in the fashion industry as we were growing up, but we're starting to see the change come through now. Yeah. And, you know, I think there are a lot just kind of relate back to what everyone is touching on this common thread. There are other ways um, to shop that isn't going to break the bank. Um, I think, you know, in our family, we started a text chain with all of our kindergarten class. And so we'll say, hey, we have toys. Hey, we have extra clothing size 2T size 5T. Does anybody want this? And we've started this like great exchange in our neighborhood. And it's amazing how much stuff everybody has. And um, it does, it like hurts my stomach sometimes. We just have bags and bags of clothes. And I'm, I don't even know how we came across all of this clothing. Like, how did we even get this? Um, so finding nice ways to sort of exchange and prolong the use of those items is really nice. Um, thank you. So let's go ahead, Jessica. Well, and Lauren, yeah, just to jump in. So we actually, um, I don't know how many of you have buy nothing communities. We have just an amazing buy nothing community um, where I live. And it's really fantastic because, I mean, it's lots of people with kids and lots of people having kids and things moving around. But we also have a fairly like socioeconomically diverse buy nothing community. And so you know, we've, and we, it's been really nice to get, like, we've got some, some lower income housing next to us, fabulous neighbors. I adore, that's always really great to hang out with them, but we've been, we've made friends with, with a lot of those, those families and they're right. Cause they're right there. And, you know, sometimes we'll offer up things and they'll come grab it. Or sometimes they'll reach out and say, Oh, I, we're having a baby and we don't have this. And again, someone has this shoved in a corner of their basement because you put it down there and didn't have the energy to get rid of it. And you can move it on to a new home really, really quickly. And you'll see, like, I saw a bouncy chair that was ours that has moved through at least four families in the group. And it just, it keeps going. So you need it for six months. And then it just keeps making its merry way along and I don't have to dust it. So everybody's winning. I love that. And if you don't have a buy nothing community, looking at companies like Goodbye Gear, who can take pre-loved items and get them into the hands of other families for a cost that, you know, is accessible and approachable to them. Um, yeah, so it's pretty heavy and dark where we are in the complexities of these ecosystems and trying to navigate them when you don't know a lot about how your behavior affects all of these different things. Um, let's talk about what we can do as individuals to help curb some of these outcomes. Why don't we start with purchasing behavior? Um, Jessica, can you talk a little bit about 
agriculture and how does buying our food matter? Where do we buy it from? What, what do you need to be aware of? So many things. And I could talk about agriculture until your ears bleed and you throw me off the call. Um, <laughs> buying our food matters so much from a number of perspectives. Um, one is I'm also a fourth generation small grains farmer. We like small farmers. Small farmers, you know, not only are they just a part of the American and global cultural lexicon, but they take really good care of their land and they do such amazing work. And so buying your food matters because again, voting with your dollar, deciding who you will support, who you can support. Again, not everybody can, can do, do everything. Um, I worked in food access. I ran farmer's markets for a long time buy local, like buy at your local farmer's market, buy, you know, buy from pop-up produce stands, check for stickers because sometimes they just go to Costco and buy things and then sell it to you. You know, get, to, if you shop at the farmer's market, get to know your farmers, you know, chat, you know, chat with them. If you can go visit their farms. Um, it's, you know, really goes a long way in, in knowing, knowing what you're eating, knowing how you're eating it. Um, uh, shopping at the farmer's market is just fun. Like we have asparagus for the first time at our farmer's market tomorrow. So it's going to be really exciting. Um, the other piece of that is if you can't shop at farmer's markets or you can't buy everything at far farmer's markets, unless you live in California, we're going to make fun of California for a second. Um, know what the labels on your food mean. Natural means nothing. There is no, like anybody can slap natural, like you could slap natural on a Hershey's bar or gummy bears or literally anything. That word means nothing. Sustainable means nothing. You know, certain labels, you know, obviously USDA organic, the non-GMO butterfly, those mean things. Animal welfare, you know, check the labels. Do There's some really great graphics you can pull up. If you Google Green America food labels, we used to have a really good one pager on it, but they're all over the place just know what those labels mean and under, you know, just, and maybe focus on like one thing a month, focus, um, and also prioritizing what you're going to eat of, of, you know, that you can source of higher quality. If you are, if you eat meat, great, no judgment. Um, you know, see if you can not do meat one night a week. That's a huge thing. Or know where, you know, know where your meat's coming from. Look at those labels and just understand where it's coming from, how it's being cultivated and who, how it's, you know, how it's benefiting the system as a whole. Food, eating should be fun. Food is delicious. Don't stress yourself out about it. I liked your earlier point about the farmer's market. It's also really fun to take your kids and an educational experience. Um, you can point things out. They can ask questions. You can ask the farmers, like, does this come from a tree? Does this come from a bush and play guessing games? So I think that's a really nice way to engage with your kids. Um, but just, just go, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, I was going to ask a follow-up question, Jessica, because I'm curious about this. Cause I know that like one of the biggest issues is like food waste, like something 40% mm -hmm. of food we don't even use. And it makes me sick. Like we try really, really hard not to like apples are dollar each now or whatever. And like yeah. that apple and my kids eat a bite of it and then put it back. Yeah. In. Yes. So we, uh, we try really hard to not waste food, but we started doing like the green chef or hello fresh or, you know, the mm -hmm. boxes, but there's so much packaging. Like, I don't know. Do you guys have a perspective on, is that good? Cause you're not wasting any food, but then you're paying for all that transport and materials. Like how does that weigh out? And so you know, again, food? and you have to balance it out for yourself because yes, it's less waste. Yes. Some of that packaging, you know, look for one of the companies because I know a lot of the companies now have, packaging that is recyclable or some companies will like collect you can send it back some which again doesn't make sense because then you're burning fossil fuel da, 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 da. but again figure out which makes sense in your life because a hello fresh makes it really easy to get dinner on the table for a bunch of people really quickly and so yes you are going to waste less food you're going to waste less time you know balance it out decide what makes sense for you and and decide what makes sense for you right now. Maybe, you know, you guys are getting ready to launch into a new city with goodbye. So maybe you're just so busy right now. You're like, the only way this is going to work is if we hello fresh for a couple months. Okay. But then look at other ways to offset that recycle compost, you know, composting is great. I had to throw out a bunch of cucumbers the other day because our compost bin went to 
went the way of the dinosaurs for some reason I can't figure out. Like Mm -hmm. you feel bad doing it, but sometimes you're like, I'm just going to do this. And you're going to, you're like the next time, instead of driving to the grocery store, I'll walk to the grocery store. Like just sort of think of a everything in balance and remember, great. You're not doing it perfectly. None of us are, but you're trying, you're doing something. And that is amazing. I read a stat once that said, um, you know, it doesn't matter if a hundred thousand people do recycling perfectly. We need to do, we need to make sure what six, 7 billion do it imperfectly. And that's when you really start to see change. And I thought that that was really impactful for me. And I was like, you're right. It's about everyone putting in effort. Um, so I loved that question, Kristen. I thought that was a really good follow-up question. Um, Kristen, do you want to talk about the benefits and value of re-commerce and the circular economy and just a little bit about why it's it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we're very passionate about this as that's the business I'm, I'm in and we're in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess the, the one major stat is that by um, reusing an item, by buying something secondhand, you're saving its carbon footprint by 82%. So it's like one of the best things you can do from durable goods perspective is to, to reuse and to not put the item in the garbage. And so I think that that um, comes back to one of the things that you were saying. Um, and how do you pronounce it? It's so- Sawala or just, I don't want to put Sala. Sala. I love the vote with your dollar. And I think it, like, it comes back to what the re-commerce and the circular economy is ultimately going to do is enable and force manufacturers to make better products. Because products that are made to fail after four or five uses are not going to be right for the circular economy. And, and those are the products that we don't wanna support. And we want manufacturers to make great products that we can quality check, that we can fix if need to, or get a replacement part that you know stands the test of time, that we can fold it, that we can ship it, and it's not going to break. You know, And, and that's something that um, I'm personally very passionate about. And like, that's the change that we want to see and we want to be an enabler for and, and goodbye gear is, is working with manufacturers to make better products that are purpose made for the, the circular economy. And I think something similar that you're doing in the um, the fashion industry too, which is, you know, crazy stats that you talked about there. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about re-commerce because of the environmental impact. And then something we talked about before is just that um, you can get more for less and it makes it more accessible for families to be able to get those great items for their kids like the love every or the snoo should be for a one percent of the population like every family should have the ability to sleep at night and and give the best toys to their children and things like that so really excited about the, the value that both for the environment and for parents i love that and i think that's such a good point that every family should have accessibility and right now that they they don't Um, And so I love entrepreneurs who are trying to change that. Um, One of the questions that I actually, this is like a follow-up question. This is for anyone to answer. Um, You know, speaking about accessibility, talking about voting with your dollar, you know, Jessica, you had mentioned the labels, needing to pay attention to the labels. What are the labels that consumers need to pay attention to in order to know that they're voting with their dollar in the right way? Um, does anybody have any suggestions in each agriculture, you know, product industry, clothing industry? What are the labels that we should be looking for? Well, I see yeah, so, oh. Oh. <laughs> you guys, sorry, I'm just going to give sort of a t- tongue in cheek answer, which is that we want it to be the goodbye certified goodbye stamp on all products that we're working on with some manufacturers, but you go ahead with your. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to piggyback piggyback off of that, it's like the trust that you build, right, with different certifications. So for us, like we use Got Certified Organic Cotton, which is like the gold standard for organic cotton. Um, So it ensures like that farming is done properly and not using like synthetic pesticides that that's done. And then even from like a supply chain perspective, like the manufacturing and the dyes that are used are all organic. Um, and that everybody's paid like a fair wage and it has livable working conditions and things like that. So looking for researching those types of standards and then ensuring that somewhere on the website that it's published, um, like then that's the way to do it for at least like with clothing, not all of the different fabrics have uh, certifications because, you know, polyester, like why would it have it? (laughs) Um, But, you know, like at least for like the natural materials, there's like 
I don't know if I say it properly, but like O-E-K-O textile certifies that like different types of chemicals aren't used in the manufacturing process. And there's different varying labels of that. Um, but yeah, that's at least what you can do for like the clothing industry. But unfortunately, like it's not regulated, right? So it's, there's just like a lot of greenwashing. So you have to search for those types of certifications and trust that they're that they're actually doing their audits and that the certifications are being renewed. Um, and if you're not, you should contact your company and see if they're actually doing it because chances are they might not know. And then that should open up questions of like, how do I trust this company if they don't know themselves? Um, so that's that's one in on ours. <laughs> I love that. And Jessica just posted a webpage, greenamerica.org slash food labels guide. That's an amazing resource. Jessica, thank you for putting it in there. I think what we'll do at the end of this is we'll also post all of these resources um, so that attendees have access afterwards. Um, Jessica, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about that webpage, but. No, I mean, that's, and again, this is an ever evolving space, um, but a, a, you know, a trick is, and again, anybody can put any, any company could put any label on anything they want. If you see something new come up, just Google it because yes, companies will make up a label to be like, we're certified this. No, you're not. No, no. Mm -mm. So, you know, just, so you know, that you shouldn't be able to do that. It's a total rabbit trail, but we're actually in the process of launching a new label. Sorry, everybody. I know there's so many out there, but focusing exactly on what, um, what Salwa was talking about sort of related on it's a it's a soil health label and it's really going to prove that what you are consuming is coming out of land that is being managed better okay. um, and there's a whole lot behind it google soil carbon initiative this is my baby this is my whole team's baby we've been working on this for years it's just starting to go public um, so there are some new labels coming out in that in this space um, and the other really amazing thing that i wanted to Echo that Sawa said is a lot of existing labels like organic and some others are in the last few years starting to incorporate social justice, labor justice, making sure that the people on the farms, in the fields, in the factories are getting paid, not just like a survival wage, but like not quite a thriving wage, but somewhere in between there. Cause that's, that's a really big piece moving forward as well. Um, and I love seeing that pop up, especially in the fashion industry. Um, and it's coming in the food space too. So that's a good point. Um, I just remember from years ago, maybe I was in college, that commercial, if you want to buy sustainable, just remember to follow the frog. Do you remember those commercials with the little frog label? Oh, no way. Okay. Well, you'll have to Google it after this because it was a whole commercial of sustainable products where you follow the frog. And that just like burned into my memory as like a 20 something year old. So, um, okay. So Salwa, um, can you help us a little bit with sustainable shopping mindset and supporting those ethical brands? Yeah. So like, as I mentioned before, like no one is going to be perfect, but really like voting with your dollar, consumers can ask and demand more transparency um, and tactics in their businesses that they're supporting. So what are you currently doing to know that I'm, that I know that you're taking it seriously and what you're doing that's sustainable, but then also on the flip side, where can you improve? Like, you know, um, not everyone is going to be perfect. Um, and so, you know, like that is starting with one. And then if they can't give you responses, if you can't find it on their website, just email them, tweet them, like ask them, see if you can like figure out what, where are they sourcing their products from? Are they in China? Do they perform annual factory visits? Do they, do they know what, where their fabric is coming from? Are they part of like the buying process of the fabric? Cause a lot of the times, a lot of companies they'll go to market really fast in the fashion industry and they'll go to like one-stop shops and the one-stop shops will source the materials for them. They'll produce it and then they'll ship it to them. Um, so they don't actually know, they can say that it's sustainable from like the factory level, but beyond the factory level, they might not know where their, where their cotton is coming from. It could end up coming from China, even if it's made in Italy. Right. So asking those questions and understanding that, um, especially if it's posted on their website, just demanding things, um, those types of information and see, and the brand should just be honest back with them. Right. Like everybody is not going to be perfect. We're all trying, at least in the sustainability space. And as a small business, like 
you know, I did my research. I went to the factory. I visited them. I understood, like I met the people that were creating our clothes and then I felt trust. And then it was through that trust that I'm passing it on. And when someone asks me that stuff, I'm happily to share it with everyone. And when they start closing things off, that's when you're like, well, like it makes you think twice about it. Mm, Very good points. Um, So in addition to understanding the impacts that we're having with the choices and the actions that we're making, let's talk a little bit about how adjusting our habits at home can make an impact and how to get our kids uh, engaged in adjusting those habits. Jessica, do you want to talk a little bit about some, just some of the easiest ways to adjust habits at home, to be more eco-conscious and maybe getting your kids involved in those habits? That's a really good question. I mean, you know, Things I've talked about, talking about where your food comes from, talking about why we can't get strawberries in January, even though, yes, I buy Driscoll's at the grocery store because small children, Um, you know, things like that are great. But, and and my eldest, I'm not even really sure how how she did this. I would like to think I'm an amazing mom, but, um, you know, thinking about if you're, if you're done with a box, a container, what else could it be used for? Like we, at the beginning of COVID, we had, um, we had a trash sculpture garden because we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. I had a newborn. We really couldn't do anything. My daughters were just like churning out art. We had the hallway lined in it. It was great. Like just, it's a really fun way to think about, you know, what else could I do with this? How else could I reuse this? Um, you know, another thing is, uh, if you're, you know, if you're giving things away, talk to your kids, not toys, just give those away in the dark of night. Don't say anything to anybody, just make them go. But if you're giving away like clothes or things, have your kids help you sort them out and say, we're giving this, you know, we don't need this anymore. We're giving this to someone else. Um, my middle child automatically thinks we're giving everything to like this one friend of hers, which we're not, but it's fine. And like, she'll now she'll come to me and be like, mommy, this doesn't fit me anymore. We should give it to Adela. And I'm like, that's great. Like sort of, you know, kids, especially like the little people, they love to be helpers. Like let them, let them be helpers, even if maybe that's not exactly what the help is doing, but that's okay when they're small. That just made me laugh so hard because my son who's four (laughs) thinks everything goes to baby Bodie, (laughs) but baby Bodie's the same size as him because he's like four months younger. (laughs) Kids are hilarious. Um, I love that. We also in my house, but outside of food, we, we do things like we're trying to get the kids in the habit of turning the lights off when we leave the room. So we let them turn the lights off. Did you turn the light off or, um, you know, water usage, we take quick showers in our house. So we talk to them about taking quick showers, not wasting water. So I think opening up the lines of communication is so important. All the little ways that you are trying to adjust your habits at home. Um, Kristen, what are some of the easiest things that we can change at home. What do you do in your house? A, a lot of what both of you guys talked about actually, but it's funny. We don't, um, we don't do the middle of the night toys thing, but we, and it's actually because probably because I started, because, you know, goodbye gear has been here since uh, my kids have been old enough to know what's going on. Um, so it's actually become part of our whole family. And I love it because when my kids want something new, like they, they're like, I want to get this new Lego thing, whatever. And, and they go find something that they're not playing with anymore. And they bring it and say, I'm going to sell this so I can get this item. And so it gets them to not think about consumers and I'm just going to buy, 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 buy. And where does it go? It's like, I'm just, I'm going to get the thing that I really want right now. And then I'm going to, you know, put something I'm not using back into circulation. And like, it's really amazing to see them doing that and participating in it. So I like, I'm really proud of, of that. Um, and we do a lot of other things that you guys have talked about, like not leaving the water when you're brushing your teeth. And, and like, we don't need to buy that because it's all packaging. You know, we're not going to buy the um, individual crackers that each come in bags because that's really bad for the environment. We can't recycle those. And then they're part of our, um, can this be recycled? And just, you know, part of all of your day-to-day things that you do. And, and then I don't know, we watch shows and things. We look at the environment and, and what's happening to the oceans. And so then they, it's amazing what sticks in their brain. And so they will be the most environmentalists, um, you know, the next generation I'm hope, very hopeful for. Cause yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. I love that. And I love, um, sort of teaching them one in one out. What are you going to sell? 
in order to be able to afford to buy that. I think that that is such an amazing thing to do with your kids. And I'm totally, I'm not doing that now. So I'm totally going to take that. My friend actually told me this a long time. I mean, I'm horrible at fashion um, and clothes. I still have clothes from like high school, but uh, much to the chagrin of my husband. <laughs> like, you need new clothes. I'm like, I got my good my gear shirt. I don't need anything else. You're like, this is um, new. You always, uh, like whatever you buy should be the favorite, your most favorite thing in your closet. And then you should like, so she always taught me this and I've tried to do this my whole life is like one thing in one thing out with my clothes as well. So like I need a new pair of jeans, okay, which jeans am I going to get rid of really makes you think different about your purchasing decisions. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I love instilling that in our children. Um, Salwa, what are some of the easiest things that you changed at home? Yeah. I mean, echoing everybody else, making small adjustments in your household, like encouraging creativity through like imaginary play, like recycling materials and crafting, um, empowering kids through everyday conversations and using daily opportunities to explain why, like, you know, we don't, we use all sides of the paper because paper comes from trees and we don't want to waste paper and trees help us breathe and they provide homes and shelters for the animals, like making it really sticky for them in that sense, that's relatable. And then, you know, lastly, just like modeling good habits, you know, at the young stages, like they are sponges. And so simple acts, like we don't use like regular paper towels this often we use reusable rags and we love Swedish dis- dishcloths. Have you guys used Swedish dish? They're no. amazing. They're the best. Oh my gosh. They're so good. They just replace paper towels are so much better than paper towels like I was kind of sad getting rid of my paper towels because it's just like sometimes like washing the rags it's like oh what did I just yeah up? Totally. Um, but Swedish they're like more like sponges um but anyways I'm like digressing but like you know using reusable rags and Swedish gift cloths and, um instead of paper towels taking your bags to the grocery store not using single-use plastic and then gardening with them you know so that they understand how things grow and how to connect with the earth in a really natural way that's like not forced I feel like what Kristen was saying is like they're going to be so eco-friendly but they're not going to think they're eco-friendly it's just going to be a part of their lifestyle yeah yeah I love that all amazing tips um having good eco-friendly habits at home is a great way to help curb you know that impact that humans are having on the planet let's talk about how we teach all of this to our kids in more ways. So um, Jessica, what are some of the top ways that you wanna leave parents after this conversation with like in their back pocket um, to teach their kids to have that healthy lifestyle um, and to respect the planet that they live on? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Lauren, you you touched on it a little bit, um, you know, just, and we've all been talking about it, like show, show your kids the way um, you know, live, live the way you would and show them the behaviors you want them to see. Like, uh, we were in New York for spring break last week. And at one point, oh, the water in the water bottle got warm, which to be fair, I also hate warm water. Um, and my daughter was like, well, we'll just buy, we'll just buy a bottle at the, at the, you know, food stand on the corner. And I'm like, honey, we're like five blocks from home. We don't need to buy a reusable or a, a single use bottle. Can we just wait? She's like, yeah you know, just, or, you know, my kids know that if we're out, you know, shopping or like farmer's market, I mean, they really don't go anywhere other than the farmer's market. Um, you know, we have our bags with us. We don't need a plastic bag, or if we don't have a bag, we'll just carry it. Or, you know, just things like that really, again, so I love how you said it. Like these kids, they're not going to think they're being eco-friendly. That's just going to be the thing you do. Like you carry your own bags. You don't, you know, I'm really excited that coffee shops are starting to let us bring our reusable cups again, because one thing I do buy a lot of is I call it external coffee, coffee that is not for my house and like single use cups over the last two years is, has been killing me. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and don't make it a, oh my God, I can't believe you forgot your bag or, you know, no, you're, oh, you're really, you know, don't make it a punishment. Don't make it a terrible thing. Like, okay. Sometimes you've got to buy a bottle of water out in the world once, once in a while, it just happens. Do it, recycle it, move on with your day. It's okay. Yeah. I like not being too hard on yourself. Um, if you don't make it super negative, you may be more likely to follow those habits. So I think that's a really good point. Um, Kristen, how, what are your top tips for parents teaching their kids about having good lifelong purchasing behaviors? What do you want to leave parents with? 
Yeah, I mean, I probably sound like a broken record, but I think it really comes back to like reducing consumerism and that buying more stuff is not a sign of success and it's not something you need to do to be happy. And I think we've seen a lot through COVID of, of people reflecting on the amount of stuff that you have and how you, that's not what's important. It's spending time with each other, it's experiences and, um, and focusing on getting great quality things that you really need and taking care of them and then passing them on. And so if that's a lesson that we could leave our kids with that, I mean, I think we'll leave our, the world in a better place as corny as that is. Um, so that would be mine. Perfect. Salwa, what are your tips that you want to leave parents with? How do they teach their kids to be more eco-conscious? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like I keep saying ditto, but it's just like everything everybody is saying is just accurate, right? Um, and, you know, it's like really just to what Christina was saying, it's like slowing your purchases down, slowing fashion down, slowing like your any sort of consumerism down a little bit and really assessing like, do I need this? Like, can I, like, you'll save money over the course of time. Like there's a personal gain out of this. Like you're not going to be shopping as much. Yeah, sure. You might buy something that's more expensive now, but you're going to use it for longer because it's going to be good quality. And then you're not going to waste money because you're constantly replacing something that's broken because it was bad quality and just did it because it was five bucks. And like, what did it take for it to be five bucks? Like who in the value chain got cut? Right. Um, so thinking, thinking about it like that from that perspective. And then again, just like demanding transparency from the people that have the resources, right? Like you large, large companies, they have the resources to do things. It's going to be costly for them because they just have scale, but they still have the resources to invest back in it. All of us as individual consumers can do our part, but in the end, it's like, we are all our own households and we have, you know, we have to live, but corp companies operate. They have money to dedicate and invest back into it. They're just choosing to invest it in different places, right? So just demanding that transparency from other companies is probably just like, the best thing that you can do as a parent to ensure that they might have like a chance when they <laughs> for better business practices to be implemented. Yeah. I love all of these. We do have a question. Um, what are some of your favorite sustainable brands that aren't going to break the bank? Do you want to go around in a circle or think about it for a minute? I'm looking around. Everyone's like, no, <laughs> I've Goodbye gear. <laughs> Goodbye gear. <laughs> I hate you. That's what I was going to say. But <laughs> I love it. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I like finding out about new brands that I hadn't heard before from e-commerce shops. And one of them that I look at is Thrive, Thrive Market. I don't know if everybody like if it's good or bad. I'm not sure, but it's one that good. Okay. Jessica gave it part of my network. They're real. They are oh, really, they're exactly. Yeah. They're exactly what Sawa said. They do, they try really hard. They do really good at a lot of things and they're trying to do better at some other things. So no, big, big fan of, of the Thrive brand oh, good. or company. They're not really a brand because yeah. they source other brands, but yeah. Yeah. I like to go onto their, onto their website and I kind of like to peruse and just look at brands that I hadn't heard of before. So I don't know if you have um, any other companies that you like, especially around like kids clothes or kids toys. I like, um, plan toys, P-L-A-N. Have you ever, they're like, um, sustainable wood toys. They're, I think designed in the U S but manufactured in Thailand, I believe. Oh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody else has any other. Uh, green toys are also made from recycled materials and they're manufactured in the U S and then the obvious cubby kit sustainable clothes, of course. Um, and then I, you know, there's brands that for like in the baby gear space and then the gear space that are, um, promoting the reuse of their products. And like one of the big things that we do at Goodbye Gear is we, um, work with manufacturers and retailers on their returns and checking for safety and putting them back into circulation. And a lot of brands don't want, uh, don't want that to happen. They'd rather have their returns destroyed, which we could do a whole podcast on what happens to returns and the massive amount of waste that is associated with that, especially in the baby gear space where most of it is destroyed um, unless it comes through us. <laughs> and so, you know, some brands, I won't name the ones that are not um, supportive of it, but ones that are, and new brands like, um, like Four Moms and Mockingbird are both really fantastic, well-manufactured brands that we call like have our stamp of approval of our certified goodbyes. Um, 
that, uh, you know, that want to build and make really great products that they want to go back into circulation and not have one use. So those would be a couple from our experience. That's awesome. And I, Kristen, I did not know that until recently that when you return an open box or you had opened something and returned the item to the store, that it doesn't go back on the floor. I thought they put it back, they check it and put it, put it back on the shelf. And that's not what happens. They destroy those products, which is yeah, it's crazy. Wet wrenching, especially if you just like had opened it up and thought, oh, this isn't for us. So you put it back and send it back. Um, so that is what that is our tips for families. Is that something that we've changed? Because um, my husband used to be like buy three pairs of shoes or three shirts and like like the color, you know, and then send the other two back. Um, and then, you know, when we started touring return centers, I was like, do you know that those other two you send back end up in the garbage? He's like, no way, no way. I'm like, yeah, unless you're buying like high quality $400 shoes that they will actually resole because they can't sell them as new if you've even walked around once in them. So, um, so unless they're very expensive and they're worth the time and effort to put a new sole on them, they go in the garbage, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah, that is wild. So I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but um, this has been such a great conversation. Jessica, do you wanna say something? I did just wanna jump in really quickly around sustainable food brands yeah. that don't break the bank. I mean, Thrive is great. There's a, like the Whole Foods 365 label is pretty good. But another thing just, and again, pick and choose what you want to focus on. Like my kids eat an inappropriate amount of dairy products. <laughs> we do, we do non-dairy too, but like, like we keep Stonyfield organic in business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Like I would rather buy really good quality products from Stonyfield because I know going down, and again, I work in this space, but going down the supply chain, like they pay their farmers really, really fairly. Those are happy cows that are living like the happy cow life. They are not in CAFOs. They're not in confined operations. Um, so I'm okay paying a little bit more for that um, because there are so few brands that are A, doing it the right way, um, mostly because most companies are incentivized to do things the wrong way because of a number of different things. Um, so really think about, you know, maybe you, you know, like I was talking about meat earlier, maybe you, you're like, you know, we're going to have meat three times a week, but we're going to buy local or we're going to buy, you know, look at, look at all the labels and find, okay, this is the best quality meat. These animals lived a really, really good life until their last day. Um, and also looking at how the farmers were treated or the farm workers and the, the folks in the processing plants. You know, if you're paying a little bit more from one of these, you know, organic brands or non-GMO brands or some of these really well, well-regarded brands with the certifications, you're paying more because that money's going down the supply chain. Um, it's not just ending up in somebody's pocket. Um, one really good plug for a food company that is trying so hard they're making mistakes but they totally end up to it they're making really good choices ben and jerry's a ice cream delicious dairy non-dairy they are doing some amazing work in a number of areas so i love that and um my dad actually was the head of marketing at ben and jerry's for a long time in burlington vermont i know so funny that you brought wait that who's up. your dad richard wens he was there okay when he was in high school I've heard the name. I work with them. Oh. So like, oh. we know a ton of, I know a ton of people there. Um, yeah. Well, tell your dad. Oh. Well done. I got to go to the factory and eat the ice cream off the conveyor belt. And it is a memory that is etched into my mind. Oh yeah. My dad is a big fan of buying a pint. <laughs> like that is the dessert. So, um, and sometimes dinner for the night because <laughs> that dad judgment is <laughs> there. I love it. Um, but yeah, some of my fondest memories. So I love that you brought up Ben and Jerry's. I think they're also a really great company. Um, but you know, this has been such an awesome conversation. We're about at time. We don't have any more questions. We went through a ton. Um, there's some resources that were put into this chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather those and we'll post them later for everyone. I'll shoot them in an email so everybody has them. Thank you to our panelists for coming today. We so appreciate your time and insights. Um, really grateful to have you. To our attendees, I hope you found this conversation helpful and fun. Um, and just thank you. Have a wonderful Friday. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you for putting this together. Yeah, of course. So thanks fun. for having us. Yeah, and the recording's going to be available. I'll send it to you all soon. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone.